In a previous video I talked about when anime went digital and how that completely changed the medium. In this video I want to look at the new generation of animators in Japan and the revolutionary tools they're using to change the medium once again. I'm going to look at how studios went from just getting to grips with digital animation in the early 2000s to studios funding whole projects based on the skills of a fresh generation of animators. A good place to start for this topic would be at the beginning of the 2000s with an individual who is now one of the biggest names in the medium but was at the time only a little known name working for a video game company. Makoto Shinkai found himself without a job in 2002 and took up the mammoth task of single-handedly creating his own anime using commercial software like Photoshop and After Effects. And after seven months of production, Voices of a Distant Star was released and set a new bar for what could be done in the industry. It gathered so much media attention that a professional dub was funded and the movie was given an official release. Shinkai had completely changed the perception of what was required to enter the industry and inspired a whole generation of independent animators. Voices of a Distant Star was just as good, if not better, than a lot of TV anime coming out at the time and it sent ripples through the industry. In his book, Anime A History, Jonathan Clements likens the impact of this project to Gainax's Daikon 4 animation in the early 80s. And this is a really good comparison that I want to bring up as they both broke industry standards and revolutionized certain techniques at the foot of new eras in the medium. And they both succeeded not because of financial funding or studio size, but a revolutionary sense of passion for the anime. It was passionate individuals working in the industry who changed the industry. This is of course infinitely more significant as it led to a very fruitful career for Shinkai. He went on to create a handful of fully realized projects, including the recent and ever successful Your Name. And that's what's important important. Before, animators would have to either go to some form of animation school or go through a studio's training program before they were even given in-between work, slogging away for years to step by step make it to the position they wanted. Shinkai was one of the early cases of people revising this process, doing it themselves. Rosuke Sawa, an animator who came from a similar video game background to Shinkai, was another very important figure in this movement. Rotimo, as he's more commonly known, was one of the first in a generation of webgen animators. These are animators who have entered the industry after the advent of the internet, and who have used the internet to break into the industry. It was Osamu Kobayashi who first scouted Rotimo for his series Beck in 2004. Without any experience in the industry, he was thrown into a key animator role. This was an unprecedented move and a huge risk for Kobayashi. Although Rotimo's portfolio was strong, there was no guarantee he could perform outside his specific style or, or adapt to that anime working environment. Thankfully, he performed magnificently and was kept on for the rest of the series. This is, similar to Shinkai, a landmark change in the industry. Rotimo had paved the way for a new generation of animators, and he would be the first of many of his kind. Hiring these kinds of animators is risky, but if successful, can produce some of the most interesting animation cuts in a series. Unique creators like this are able to perform highly in unconventional techniques, and, and whole styles have been birthed by these rogue animators. From now on, a whole new sector of the market was born. Let's look at how it evolved. With new animators came new animation tools. We discussed in the last video that anime had turned into a digital medium, but even with the aid of computers, the majority of the industry still used pencil and paper for the fundamentals of their craft. But the wave of webgen animators had brought their own tools, the most popular being Flash, an off-the-shelf animation program. Now, there are some misconceptions when talking about Flash animation, especially in anime. It's a very popular technique in the current industry, but the software isn't actually used to animate anything. Animators use Flash today, much like how animators on Akira used the quick action recorder back in 1988. They draw out each frame in Flash and preview the movement of each scene to make sure it all flows, but they'll composite the actual animation in the traditional way. Much like Akira, this is a time-saving technique that just slightly blends the traditional animation process. Although some creators have taken this innovation to the next level. Masaki Yasa and his studio Science Saru have used Flash as an actual animation tool, using the automatic in-between animation to create some funky and unique movement that just couldn't be achieved with pencil and paper. Yasa used this on his series Ping Pong and in Saru's recent movie Lou Over the Wall that showcased some of the most interesting and elegant animation sequences I've ever seen. This is really smart and efficient, a perfect example of the webgen attitude. 
But let's look at how webgen animators went from industry rarities to a well accepted career path. The evolution of webgen animation really coincides with specific projects. Shows or movies where the people in charge actively seeked out unconventional talent and gave them the creative control they needed to push their abilities. When an animator has to stick too closely to a storyboard or specific style, they can lose their personal signature and end up just fitting in with everyone else. It takes directors and producers to break the mould and allow them to develop. One of the early and very important examples of a project like this was the anime adaptation of Tetsuan Birdie in 2008. This is important for two reasons. One is that it gave Ryo Timo a considerable amount of screen time to showcase his growing skill on a large platform, and it can be seen as part of a stylistic turning point in anime. Around this time, the medium was changing quite significantly, and there's no doubt that the introduction of webgen animators contributed to this. You can see a real contrast from the style of shows before this and the style of shows after this. Rotimo's work here still has a long way to come, but it's certainly distinct and stands out as different from the standard animation of the show. He has this style where he really puts focus on the key frames, almost having each little moment of action appear in slow motion throughout the scene, just to highlight the key poses. This gives off an enormous sense of style and adds a lot to the way of the action in his cuts. He also quite fantastically moves the camera, almost at all times even if it's just subtle camera wobble. Rotimo's contributions were extremely valuable and he was offering a skill that might not have been developed had he gone through the traditional education process. Tetsuan Birdie is certainly important but the real landmark project was in 2013 with Yuzakura Quartet Hana no Uta. This was a new adaptation of the franchise by Tatsunoko Productions, who, after decades and decades of production, were now in the business of bringing to life more unique and interesting projects. Looking at this decade in comparison to the studio's other decades shows a real interest in creating experimental works and hiring unconventional staff, a move I think is quite overlooked by a lot of fans when talking about the studio. More importantly, Rotimo was given the incredibly daunting task of taking on the roles of director, chief animation director, and even doing some storyboard and character design work. It became his project. This was a mammoth task for Rotimo, having only been in the industry a single decade, but he didn't plan on cutting any corners. He brought in a myriad of young contemporary staff to work on the show and sprinkled them throughout each episode. I can only imagine what the studio would have looked like during production. The amount of variety and sheer size of its staff would normally be frowned upon. It's a huge case of too many chefs spoil the broth, except the chefs ended up creating a rather tasty broth. What I liked about the animation of the show was how varied it was. It wasn't only action scenes or specific cuts, there were moments of impressive animation in every corner of the show. I specifically like the cuts of Ru Nakayama, who specialises in energetic character animation. He uses perspective brilliantly and has a real skill for animating non-human elements. Sprinkling unique pieces of animation like Nakayama's throughout the series adds such a personal touch to the show. You really get the sense that this production was something different and new something that had a lot of passion in it. Although this was just a single TV series, it became an immensely important project, paving the way for countless similar ventures in the future. Rotimo's work here was so unique and changed the way people approached the anime industry. The era of webgen animators was now in full swing. Recognising the appeal and artistic success of Yuzakura Quartet, Space Dandy was released a year later in 2014, it shared the same idea of giving a platform to lots of different creators, but had a much more established foundation. Shinichiro Watanabe came in as the general director of the series, and Space Dandy attracted individuals from every stylistic corner of the industry, with lifetime veterans to up-and-coming talent. It was almost a celebration of the modern anime industry, with every episode offering something new and impressive. And that's how it worked, people were given a basic conceptual foundation to start with, but had complete creative control to take their episodes wherever they wanted. Everything from the gorgeous expressionist animation of Shinyo Hira or Masaki Yuasa to Yutaka Nakamura's mesmerising character animation to Yoshimichi Kameda's explosive action animation. Space Dandy has it all. There's never a dull moment. And the series distinguished itself even more from the norm by premiering its episodes in America hours before they were shown in Japan. With a full English dub, Space Dandy was one of the first anime shows to really acknowledge this massive online overseas market, which makes it a real landmark for modern digital anime. It was not only acknowledging that these markets exist, but completely embracing them. It was traditional in many aspects of its production, but completely contemporary with how it presented itself. I think the legacy and success Space Dandy has left behind will be massively influential in where the industry goes in the future. It both pays respect to the medium's classics and looks forward to the future. It's a milestone 
in the modern era of anime. You could say that these last few projects have completely changed the way anime production works. We have shows every year now utilising new and exciting staff, and presenting their projects in innovative ways. A few years prior, in 2009, a manga artist named One began publishing a webcomic named One Punch Man. Despite its homemade aesthetic, the webcomic garnered a massive amount of attention, and in 2012 he was approached by Yusuke Murata with an offer to redraw his webcomic and publish it in a popular magazine, and after the continued success of this, uh, an anime was put into production, and it would be a very special production. With now legendary animators such as Yoshimichi Kameda and Hidehiko Sawada working on the show, it quickly captured the community with breathtaking animation cuts. In a time where the majority of TV anime productions are scarcely animated and corner cutting, One Punch Man was a surprise to most viewers, something they might have never seen before. And because of this, it pushed a really important message. The complexity of One Punch Man's production wasn't down to a budget or a staff size, but down to the passion of the people who worked on it. It changed a lot of viewer perceptions about about anime production and gave everyone a real appreciation for the most important variable in a production, passion. And with the industry's celebration of unique talents with projects like One Punch Man and Space Dandy has come a celebration from the community as well. Celebrating the intricacies and stylistic scope of animation has become a popular topic, with many fans adopting the term sakuga. Now sakuga is a term that just means animation in Japan, but like terms such as moe and otaku, it's gained additional connotations. We now refer to sakuga as a term of endearment for specific animation cuts, almost to say that sakuga refers to good animation rather than just animation in general, and this has formed a whole corner of the community who enjoy studying and celebrating exemplary animation. Animators like Kameda and Rotimo have gained legendary status among fans, and have actually become commercial draws for projects themselves, just like directors or voice actors. And on the back of these pivotal careers and projects, we've seen changes in anime studios as well, who are essentially the backbone of the industry. The way studios function hasn't really changed since Tezuka invented the system back in the early 60s, which has led to a lot of controversy in working conditions and rates of pay as the industry has scaled up, especially in recent years. But a number of studios have embraced the new culture. There have been older studios that have evolved into a modern digital environment like Shaft and Kyoto Animation, who have both changed the systems to which they work and employ exciting staff. Kyoto Animation have been praised constantly over the last few years for their unique working conditions, and there are also new studios birthed from the ambitious individuals of older studios like Trigger and Mappa, founded by industry veterans to create new and experimental productions, and also completely new studios that have become viable because of niche markets and an interest in avant-garde styles because of anime's digital era, such as Science Saru. Yuasa has been able to start his own studio and really push the abilities of himself and his team. They've created two movies this year and have a series coming out for Netflix next year. They're blurring the line between the commercial mainstream and niche obscurity. I can't imagine this would have been viable to this consistency in previous decades. And that brings us to right now, we're in the midst of a digital revolution in anime, where the most exciting productions each year are obscure staff lists with experimental visions. No longer are we constrained to bulk productions of long-running anime. The last few years have been jam-packed with exciting new productions being made in fascinating new ways, and they're more easily accessible than ever, with streaming services offering more and more options to watch anime. And with big players like Netflix funding exciting projects like US's Devilman, who knows what might be around the corner? But we're still in the very early days of the industry shift, and I'm interesting to see everybody's perception of this, so please leave a comment on this video with the aspect that you're most excited about seeing over the next coming years. Is it seeing more attention given to interesting animators, or having more inclusive access to anime with streaming services? Let me know in the comments, and if you did enjoy this video, please make sure you're subscribed and sharing it around if possible. I've got a bunch more exciting projects that I'm uh, currently making, and they'll be on the channel in the next coming weeks, so please keep an eye on it. And of course, if you want to follow me on social media like Twitter or Facebook, you can find those links in the description. But for now, why don't you check out another video? Just click one on the screen.